Thanks to all the audience who follows our broadcast today. We're live on the second day of the 2020 International Web-Based Neurosurgery Congress. Remember, we're streaming on YouTube Live too. Today, we have the honor of having Dr. Shin. Dr. Shin is a well-known neurosurgeon at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's the director of the Spinal Deformity and Spine Oncology Surgery Department of Neurosurgery at Massachusetts General Hospital from Harvard Medical School. Today at the IWBNC, Dr. Shane is going to share his lecture titled Cervical Spinal Deformity, Alignment Considerations, and Osteotomy Techniques for Correction. Please type the questions in the Q&A section. We will read them after the end of Dr. Shane's intervention. Welcome, Dr. Shane, and thank you. Uh, you can start. It is all yours. Great. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you again to the, all the event organizers for uh, the invitation to uh, spend this time with you. Uh, it's an incredible program and uh, I've had the pleasure of watching some of the talks as well. So over the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I thought we'd talk about cervical spine deformity and some of the alignment considerations uh, that are important in terms of evaluating these patients and also go into several case cases to go over osteotomy techniques. So when we think about cervical deformity, uh, there are a lot of considerations here, including decompression, the goals of stabilization, and how to stabilize. Here is just a case example of a patient who has a severe multi-level cervical stenosis, as you can see all the way on the left, that's a T2 sagittal MRI sequence where the patient has multifocal stenosis in the subaxial spine, but also at the cervical thoracic junction. The patient also has deformity, as you can see, with significant abnormality in the alignment and the position of the vertebral body, specifically at C4 and C5. The CT scan in the middle also demonstrates this abnormality. And you can imagine the course of the spinal cord and the nerve roots as a result of that. We tried to get standing scoliosis x-rays on this patient, because, but she was so uh, disabled with regards to myelopathy that we could only piece together a supine x-ray. But you can see here that it's very difficult to assess really what the cervical alignment is in this position. When we look at healthcare data in the United States, we see that overall the, the sort of the utilization of posterior cervical fusion has dramatically increased over the last two decades. You can look at from 2000 to 2016, and by looking at various insurance-based procedure codes that the utilization of posterior cervical fusion has increased. Specifically looking at osteotomy codes and multi-level fusion codes, you can see that over almost a 20 year period, that has significantly increased. Now, coupled with an aging population and increased need for revision and extension surgery, you can see here how this has major implications for practicing spine surgeons, whether neurosurgery or orthopedic. And there is significant growth in the utilization of posterior instrumented techniques for severe and complex cervical spine disorders. So what causes a cervical deformity and what does that mean? There are obviously a number of different causes here, one of them being habitual, muscular, but also we see them as a result of prior surgery in the form of laminectomy or even laminoplasty. It can happen, it has been reported. It can happen as a result of trauma as well. Patients may have had a vertebral body fracture, ligamentous injury uh, with healing without surgery. Uh, and they may have fused or healed in kyphosis. Patients also develop kyphosis, deformity, scoliosis as a result of infection and also cancer and after radiation. And then there are the really difficult conditions to diagnose and treat, including inflammatory disorders, storage diseases, collagen disorders. These are often difficult to treat not only medically, but also surgically. But what are the most common causes of deformity in the cervical spine? Foremost would be failed surgery in terms of whether it's pseudarthrosis, instrumentation failure, adjacent level degeneration. These are all issues that we face in current modern practice. 
One of the other causes also is not recognizing a deformity, not recognizing a malalignment to begin with. Simply relying on an MRI or a CT scan prior to surgery, making plans based off of that can also lead to an unrecognized fusion in kyphosis or not recognizing an underlying deformity. Also, too much bone resection without stabilization can certainly lead to a deformity, kyphosis, as well as laminectomy, laminoplasty. What are the consequences? Well, as we know, the consequences can lead to significant neck pain, myofascial symptoms pain. Patients will often go for trigger point injections, facet blocks, acupuncture, a lot of different therapeutic interventions to try to alleviate them from this type of pain. Cervical spondylosis degeneration leads, it also leads to postural compensation. And I'll show examples of that. Spinal cord compression eventually, severe stenosis and nerve injury. Progressive myelopathy can happen. And in the most severe cases, we see loss of motion, increased rigidity, as well as limited horizontal visual gaze. And so for these patients, as they develop kyphosis, it'll be harder for them to actually look straight ahead. And you can imagine how that will impact quality of life and the ability to swallow, to drive, to do simple tasks that we often take for granted. As the kyphosis or the cervical deformity progresses, this leads to compensation that goes into overdrive with the rest of the musculoskeletal system, leading to increased low back pain, hip pain, knee pain, as the rest of the body is trying to accommodate for the primary driver of the cervical deformity. We know from earlier studies, and there has been a, there have been a lot of research in recent years looking at the implication of standing regional cervical alignment and outcomes in cervical fusion surgery. This is one of the earliest studies here by the ISSG looking at essentially the relationship of the sagittal C2 to C7 SVA and its relationship with patient reported outcomes postoperatively. And here they looked at a number of variables, including the neck disability index. And in addition to other studies that have uh, subsequently been published, we know now that an SVA more than approximately four centimeters is significantly associated not only with worse outcomes, but also worse patient reported outcomes with regards to pain and disability and function. Likewise, there's an increasing body of literature looking at the role or the significance of sagittal alignment in the cervical spine as it relates to outcomes after surgical surgery for cervical myelopathy. This is a study led by Zogo Gawala that looked at this. This is a prospective non-randomized cohort looking at patients that underwent either dorsal or ventral fusion surgery for myelopathy and associated worse outcomes with greater sagittal imbalance in the cervical spine. Well, post-laminectomy kyphosis, what does it look like? These patients will come to clinic and to the office with their heads thrust forward somewhat. They may not have chin on chest and their horizontal gaze may not necessarily be affected, but their heads will be sort of positioned forward relative to their shoulders. When we look at that radiographically on x-rays, we can see the exaggerated kyphosis as you see here in the middle caption. This is a lateral x-ray. And this patient uh, on this x-ray had multi-level laminectomies that you can see here with resection of numerous spinous processes and lamina from C2 uh, down to about C7. And on the MRI, well, the MRIs are performed supine. And with that being in mind, we're taking away the weight of the head, the cranium, as well as gravity, uh, we don't, we can clearly see the kyphosis here, but in some cases it may not be as evident. And that's why getting standing x-rays is very important. But in the case of post-laminectomy kyphosis, where the dorsal elements and the ligamentous structures have been removed, what ends up happening is that these patients can have recurrence of their myelopathic symptoms from this sort of bowstring effect of the spinal cord over that ventral kyphus of the cervical spine. What do we see? This is a patient seen in clinic, again, with you can tell that that chin-brow vertical angle is abnormal that patient is at rest in the neutral position 
is not necessarily looking straight ahead, but looking down towards the floor. The chin is not quite on the chest, but this patient clearly has kyphosis. And what do we see here? We see a really prominent trapezius muscle here. Uh, this patient previously had a posterior cervical laminectomy, and you can see how, as circled in purple here, these patients often look as if they have really hypertrophied muscles because these are the shoulder girdle muscles that are trying to keep the head upright. And all the way on the right side, you can see the prominent, the prominent spinous processes and the bumps that you see there that most patients are concerned about. And uh, this causes significant pain and also uh, it's cosmetically not uh, very appealing for these patients. But this is a classic representation of what we see after laminectomy with the expected paraspinal atrophy of the surrounding musculature. So when the cervical spine deforms, what happens? There are a lot of ways to assess this, and this is a great paper from 2013 in JNS Spine, references here, where and in this, this cartoon really captures some of the essences of what we're trying to look at when we look at cervical alignment. Key being the chin-brow vertical angle, and it's literally just this. It's the angle between the chin, the brow, and a straight line drawn towards the floor. We're also interested in the cervical lordosis measured between C2 and C7. There are several different ways to measure this, and I would encourage you just to pick one and be consistent with it, but this is also a key radiographic alignment parameter. Of increased significance and interest is this concept of the T1 slope, which is basically an angle created from the a line drawn from the superior end plate of T1 and a horizontal line. And this gives us an idea of essentially how much cervical lordosis that patient really should have to remain in sagittal alignment and sagittal balance. And the C2 to C7 SVA we discussed earlier. When we look at deformity of the spine, we may be initially keyed into one specific area, whether it's the cervical spine or the lumbar spine. And it's very important to identify and pinpoint exactly what is the driver of the deformity and what is the compensation mechanism or you know, what is secondary. In the neutral spine, uh, as seen here in depiction A, uh, that patient is in balance. That global SVA is within a normal range. And you can see here that whatever plumb line you use, whether it's C2 or C7, that is certainly within the L5S1 sort of pivot point uh, in terms of an anatomic landmark. When kyphosis is the main driver, as you can see here, what ends up happening in B is that as the kyphosis develops, and that patient is trying to maintain upward gaze, horizontal neutral gaze, there's a compensation mechanism happening here where there's further retroversion of the pelvis, increased lordosis in the lumbar spine. And you can see that that C2 and C7 SVA is now negative. It's behind L5S1 um, in, in this situation as that patient is really maximally trying to maintain horizontal gaze. Now consider a different scenario as we see here in C where the patient has a primary lumbar issue, a flat back deformity as depicted here. And that patient is thrust forward with a grossly positive C2 or C7 global SVA. And they have in essence, possibly hyperlordosis of their cervical spine as they're trying to compensate for the flat back deforming in the lumbar spine. So this is an exercise that we take our students and residents through. It's a cartoon, it's easy to look at, uh, it's, it's fairly easy to comprehend, and I think establishes at least a conceptual framework of how to think about these patients. And along with not just getting, I mean, referring to a cartoon, but getting three foot scoliosis x-rays whenever we're assessing a patient with a cervical or cervical thoracic deformity can be very helpful in this regard. For that reason, again, getting these three foot films is very important. And uh, there are various machines that allow us to do that. Uh, this is uh, one of the type of uh, devices, uh, machines that we have here. This is just, this is not a patient, this is a model 
from the manufacturer. And as you can see, the ideal position is really to not be, for the patient to not be supported in any way. So we can get a true sense of what their uh, sagittal alignment is. Uh, that way, whether they're leaning forward or they're compensating, we can see with their arms up by their shoulders or across the chest, we can get a sense for what they're doing. What we don't want to see is when you see the lateral x-ray and you see the arms completely outstretched and they're in front of the patient holding onto the wall because that in essence is giving us an idea of how that patient is compensating for the deformity which is also valuable to a certain extent. But if we're trying to get a true sense of what that unsupported alignment is like, it's best to have them unsupported with their arms and their hands outstretched. As with any type of uh, deformity, whether it's lumbar or cervical, we have to start at the base and get a sense for pelvic incidence, the pelvic tilt, the degree of retroversion, and how that relates to the lumbar lordosis. And as uh, many of you are likely familiar, we have to keep in mind the global parameters such as the SVA, the pelvic tilt, which is our uh, indicator of the extent of pelvic retroversion to compensate for uh, a loss of lar lordosis and the mismatch between the lordosis and the pelvic incidence. There are a number of other different parameters that can be evaluated, including the T1 pelvic angle, uh, but uh, these are the basic uh, parameters that we use starting at the base to get a general sense of where is the deformity? Is it the lumbar spine? Is it the cervical? And what's the compensatory mechanism here? Uh, this is a, a slide from uh, my colleague and friend, Chris Ames from UCSF, and just describing uh, in an illustrative form the concept of uh, this sort of cervical thoracic incidence, similar to the pelvic incidence, and in that looking at the T1 slope, the patient has a large T1 slope. That T1 angle tends to be higher. You know, that patient may really require a greater cervical lordosis to maintain horizontal gaze, and that has implications for planning correction, the goals of correction, and what the type of osteotomies you're going to perform, and whether you're going to do something posterior, front back, uh, and, and in terms of surgical planning. On the other side, someone with a relatively shallow T1 slope may not necessarily require so much cervical lordosis, and you'll see that not only on the cervical uh, film, but also on the global uh, scoliosis x-ray. Uh, this is a cervical deformity classification published and uh, proposed uh, by the ISSG and really highlights some of the key parameters that we're looking at that I mentioned earlier, including the sagittal cervical SVA uh, with the normal range being somewhere between zero to four centimeters and increasing from there, four to seven, greater than seven. This is something easy that you can measure on your PACS image uh, when that patient comes to clinic. We can also measure the horizontal gaze. What is that chin brow vertebral angle? Uh, chin, brow, chin brow, I'm sorry, vertical angle. Ideally should be less than 10 degrees, starting to get abnormal 10 to 25, clearly abnormal more than 20 degrees. And then we have another metric. It's looking at the T1 slope and the cervical lordosis. And looking at the relationship between that, as we just saw in the last slide, what is the relationship between that T1 slope and cervical lordosis? Is it less than 15 degrees, more than 20 degrees? If it's more than 20 degrees, you know that there is a mismatch. And then there are the functional uh, outcome measures that we are familiar with, the modified JOA scale and other pain indices that we can look at. But these are the primary cervical alignment parameters that we use in clinic. So now that we have a sense of how to look at the radiographs as neurosurgeons, spine surgeons, we're very good at looking at MRIs. We can assess the degree of stenosis. We can look for evidence of foraminal compression, T2 uh, hyperintensity within the spinal cord. But how do we assess the true nature of the deformity? Well, that takes a degree of deeper uh, investigation, looking at various radiographs, whether they're standing um, and also supine. And the, the reason to do this is to determine the degree of flexibility. Is this a patient with ankylosing spondylitis with a really rigid and a fixed deformity? 
or is it someone who has who's in kyphosis but has some flexibility with flexion and extension? And so getting flexion extension radiographs can be helpful. Also getting supine lateral x-rays with the head resting uh, on the bed or a, a pillow or a blanket can also be very helpful to see what it's like when the spine is not loaded. So it's important to assess both the regional and the global balance. It's also very helpful preoperatively to review the CT scan for these patients to look for the extent of ankylosis, any bridging osteophytes anteriorly across the disc space, any fusion across the facet joints, gives us a little more detail in terms of thinking about, is it gonna be feasible to do posterior column osteotomies alone? Well, if there's significant anterior bridging across the disc spaces and la the lateral uh, and around the vertebral bodies and the disc spaces laterally, well, those posterior facet osteotomies may not necessarily do so much since they're so rigid in the front. Likewise, patient with rigid disc osteophytes anteriorly, I mean, posteriorly, patients with rigid fixed facets posteriorly may not move so much with an anterior approach. Traction can be helpful, whether done uh, as an inpatient on the floor or in the operating room, can be very helpful to determine the flexibility deformity. Obviously, when done outside the operating room, requires a lot of concerted um, uh, management and uh, coordination with the nursing staff, uh, but can be very helpful in terms of giving us an idea of how much correction we can get with various anterior or posterior stages. With surgery, we can plan for anterior approaches, posterior approaches, or combined. With all that said, what can go wrong? Well, a lot can go wrong in these patients, right? There's a high risk of paralysis, neurological injury. There is potential vascular injury with the carotid and vertebral arteries, esophageal soft tissue injury. Um, and there's also medical injuries such as cardiac events. Uh, this is an uh, um, illustration from a JNS Spine uh, publication um, from several years ago. The citation was in a previous slide demonstrating different uh, classification and grades to these type of osteotomies. And we'll touch on some of them here, but they all have different utilizations and different strengths. This is a patient that I treated who developed a severe cervical kyphosis, a kyphoscoliosis of the cervical spine after undergoing treatment for head and neck cancer, chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation. This patient over time developed significant head tilt. You can see that the right shoulder is significantly elevated compared to the left. The head is rotated. The chin is towards the left shoulder. And this is at rest. This is how this person saw the world. This person was still able to work, able to drive and do most things, but had significant disability and pain related to this. And you can see just by looking at this uh, picture on the, down, on the bottom right, that it have also affected her stance and her ability to walk straight. So she did not have any lumbar issues, no hip issues or orthopedic joint issues in lower extremities, but she had a severely abnormal gait because she was used to looking at the world from this distorted, deformed position. Looking at the radiographs, MRI, you would think doesn't look too bad. There may be some moderate stenosis at C3-4, but otherwise we see the contour of the spinal cord. We see the T2 signal throughout, but the x-rays tell a different picture, right? So just by looking at her in the previous picture, you would think there must be something going on here. The MRI doesn't show it. She's not grossly myelopathic, but there's something going on. This AP cervical spine x-ray demonstrates that. You can see here that there is a significant uh, abnormal curvature here, and there is an asymmetric collapse, particularly on the right side. These are the lateral films with neutral flexion and extension. That cervical SVA is more than four centimeters. And you can see this is not a fixed deformity. There is some motion here. You can see that there is a anterolysthesis between C3-4 there's a lot of spondylosis between C4-5, C5-6. And with flexion, that listhesis at C3-4 does become exaggerated. You could see the space between the spinous processes with flexion and extension. There is some change there. So even with maximal extension, you can see how the subocciput uh, is really nearly touching C1 
and she's really trying to uh, compensate as much as you can, but there's only so much that she can do. And that is just in the sagittal plane. Coronal plane, she's not able to correct herself. These are the scoliosis films here, and you can see just the extent of that kyphoscoliosis in her cervical spine. CT angiogram, in terms of thinking about planning surgery, very helpful in these cases, specifically in the subaxial cervical spine, where we're, we know that there's gonna be a degree of rotation, angulation, collapse. And as you can see here, there is significant collapse at the level C3-4 with impingement and distortion of the vertebral artery on the right side. And this is important to know because if we're, if we're planning an osteotomy correction, we have to know where that vertebral artery is. Is it dominant? Is it, uh, you know, what's the caliber of that vessel? Does it reconstitute? Is it occluded in that area? Uh, it's something to be mindful of whenever planning these type of operations. So whenever I'm considering doing an osteotomy in the cervical spine or planning a three column osteotomy, CTA, uh, it can be very helpful for that purpose. So this patient, we uh, performed this operation through a staged operation, one through uh, intraoperative traction of reduction with anterior osteotomies, as you can see here, uh, and posterior facet osteotomies through a posterior stage. You can see why that CTA was very important because through this anterior approach, we're gonna do essentially an ACDF, but also drill out those uncinet processes all the way out, further releasing the entire anterior aspect of the vertebral column, identifying the vertebral arteries on both sides, as well as the exiting nerve roots all the way out. Now, typically for an anterior cervical discectomy or corpectomy, we're not doing that. But in this instance, because that patient was locked down on that right side with that severe compression, uh, we're gonna open that space up. We needed to remove and resect that uncinted process. And it was very important to know where that vertebral artery was in that situation. So this is an intraoperative x-ray. Uh, this is with uh, cross table x-ray with 10 pounds of traction. You can see there's not much movement there uh, with regards to the, uh, the, the, uh, the kyphosis between C3 and C4. But with regards to the scoliosis there, it did open up with traction. We're able to open that up. So now you can see that there is definitely a gap in the facet on the right side at C3 and C4. as indicated here. So on the previous x-ray, you can see that that was nearly bone on bone. You just saw a lot of sclerotic bone touching, uh, but with the traction, we could see that opening up and that gave me some information as well, telling me that yes, with an osteotomy, with taking that uncinet down, we're gonna be able to release that completely. And essentially that's what we did. So using cast bar pin distraction posts, and in this case, placing the cast bar pins offset the midline uh, cheating a little more on the right side allowed me to asymmetrically open up that disc space. Uh, and in addition to the uncinted drilling, take down the uh, uncinted process and uh, free up the retrieval artery, visualize the nerve root, and perform a two level anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Here we use carbon fiber uh, uh, cages uh, with anterior plating instrumentation for that purpose. Then subsequently turn the patient over and followed by posterior cervical thoracic uh, instrumentation fixation and uh, multi-level facet osteotomies to provide uh, some more cervical lordosis here. And this is her scoliosis x-ray um, afterwards. And again, what I was mentioning before about, you know, having the patient sort of stand uh, with arms up uh, assisted in the x-ray machine. Um, that takes a little bit of uh, education and discussion with our uh, radiology services and techs. Um, but um, here is an example. And, you know, with the arm support, you could see that that SVA is a little bit negative, but definitely better than it was before. And this is postoperatively. So you can see the significant improvement in not only the lateral alignment, and, but also um, looking at the patient straight on. So really addressing that kyphoscoliosis and improving her pain and quality of life. And, and this patient was really thrilled with this. This was more than five years ago. And, um, and, and even though she wasn't necessarily myelopathic and the things that we look at as neurosurgeons, uh, this definitely had a benefit in terms of her self-reported 
um, pain as well as disability and quality of life. So that's an example of a complex cervical deformity, kyphoscoliosis dealing with anterior and posterior osteotomies. But, you know, what do we do with patients with severe cervical kyphosis, chin on chest deformity? This is a case uh, of a 54 year old who went to another hospital nearly 10 years ago um, with severe difficulty ambulating, problems with the use of her hands, coordination, arms and legs. Uh, really painted a picture for cervical myelopathy and had this MRI. This MRI demonstrates multi-level cervical stenosis. Again, this was from another institution, so the images are somewhat grainy, I apologize. But we, what you can see here from the, I believe these are STIR images, the significant subaxial cervical stenosis from ventral and dorsal pathology, not necessarily crossing the cervical thoracic junction, but primarily between C3 and C6. This patient underwent a posterior decompression and instrumented fusion. Uh, the laminectomy was between C3 and C7, and the instrumentation was between C3 and C6. After that operation, patient went to rehab, noted some improvement, but still had severe arm and hand pain, even worse to a certain extent. Postoperatively, this is a CT scan that the patient had. And as you can see here, the patient has instrumentation, these are lateral mass screws placed at C3, C4, C5, and C6. And immediately postoperative, you can notice that there are some issues here, right? So the spine, the, the, there's not adequate lordosis here. There's multi-level degeneration here, as well, as well as there are several screws within the facet joint. So there's the lateral mass screw in the facet joint at C3, 4, as you can see in the middle caption, uh, facet joint in C4, 5. It appears to be that C6 screws in the foramen there. And all the way to the right, you can see on the other side, there's been some pull out of that instrumentation uh, at the, the C3 level. You see a little bit of, uh, not necessarily halo, but it's actually pull out of the screw from the bone. You also see the screw into the foramen at that level. Three months later, the patient develops severe neck and arm pain and persistent symptoms despite that operation. And the patient went to rehab and still had significant, significant problems. But now the patient was having worse issues with head alignment and the head feeling increasingly heavy. Repeat MRI was performed demonstrating adequate decompression. We can't quite see CSF around the spinal cord, but there's definitely been extensive laminectomy as you can see. And, but the problem is that the patient was not getting better. In fact, in fact, Neck pain was worsening, ambulation was getting worse. CT scan demonstrating further screw pullout, worse kyphosis. And that patient presented with a chin brow, vertical angle greater about 35 degrees or more, unable to attain horizontal gaze, some recurrence of the myelopathic symptoms, now bilateral spastic clonus, wheelchair bound, deteriorating, and uh, really looking for help. And these are the x-rays, standing scoliosis x-rays, as you can see. And again, this looks very similar to the cartoon that I, I showed earlier from the previous publication with, again, an exaggerated lumbar lordosis, even without showing you the parameters here, looking at, as you can tell, that that patient has is significantly retroverting their pelvis. Lumbar lordosis is exaggerated. You see an accentuated thoracic kyphosis. And even with the arms outstretched, right? So you can see the arms outstretched in the x-ray booth that patient is having a difficult time uh, maintaining a neutral horizontal gaze. And that chin is very close to the sternum. And this is just a zoomed view looking at, you can see the instrumentation pull out. You can see the proximity of the instrumentation to the skin and the atrophy that's there. And just the relationship of the head to the shoulders. And again, putting the cartoon side by side with the scoliosis x-ray, very helpful. We can see that even without showing you the alignment parameters, you can see that that SVA globally is negative. Flexion extension, it's not a rigid deformity. It's rigid to an extent that there's instrumentation there. And even though there's pseudarthrosis and screw pullout, it's still somewhat rigid because the screws are fixed by rods. But there is some flexibility because the patient does have some motion between the occiput and C2 between flexion and extension, you can see that. You can see that on flexion, the distance between the subocciput and the C2 spinous process, there are several centimeters there. 
with extension, maximal compensation, that patient loses that and there's uh, basically bone on bone touching there. Cervical lordosis, well, it's negative, right? That patient is severely kyphotic. That SVA, global SVA as we measured, almost 12 centimeters. That pelvic incidence measured in this patient is 39 degrees and a significant mismatch with a lumbar lordosis, right? So this is not a flat back deformity. In fact, this patient is hyperlordotic because they're overcompensating for the cervical deformity that is evident. We, we, as an exercise, we have all our trainees uh, go through this, uh, coming up with all our different parameters. Uh, we have this on the operating board and uh, we, we go through this as an exercise, not only for educational purposes, but also to plan this out and to really assess what our degrees of correction are in the operating room. Again, going back to this, what, it is, what is our plan? So in this case, uh, for this patient, my plan was to go from posterior to revise the instrumentation to perform multi-level posterior facet osteotomies, posterior column osteotomies. As you can see here, this, is, this would be considered grade two. In addition to uh, grade six, three column pedicle subtraction osteotomy through the C7 vertebra. Uh, and this is, uh, again, this is from uh, Chris Ames is a, a great publication from a number of years ago demonstrating their technique. And this just really shows in a cartoon fashion what that looks like in terms of creating that triangular wedge in the uh, cervical thoracic junction. And this was, this publication is really at C7. This case I'm gonna show you was performed at C7, but now we're doing this at T1 and T2 for reasons I'll get into uh, momentarily. But the technique is similar to what we do in the lumbar spine when we're doing a lumbar PSO. But obviously the considerations here are different because of the regional uh, vascular structures, the carotid vertebral artery, the vertebral artery specifically, but also the spinal cord and the nerve roots. So as opposed to lumbar spine doing an L4 PSO, uh, you know, we can manipulate the cauda nerve roots uh, to a certain degree, um, retract, manipulate the dura fecal sac. Obviously in the cervical spine, cervical thoracic junction, we don't have that liberty. Plus with the cervical spinal cord and the dura sort of outstretched and strung over uh, the ventral kyphus of the deformity, there's extra tension on the spinal cord and the nerve roots. So there are a lot of nuances here that we have to be careful of. But the rationale for the PSO, well, in this case, it can provide significant correction of angulation, 30 degrees with the addition of the posterior facet osteotomies, we can get even more flexibility of the spine after taking out the lateral mass screws. And after creating that triangular wedge through a variety of techniques, uh, the idea is to close that down and hinge that across the ventral cortex of the C7 vertebral body, literally closing the door, closing the hinge, getting the correction there, and then creating a new foramen for the nerve roots. And in this case, it'll be the C7 and C8 nerve roots that now will share one sort of super foramen that was created by the complete facet osteotomies and the pedicle resection. So how do we do this? This is how we do it. So this is uh, at the MGH. I have a patient here. Uh, you can see uh, just uh, they're, they're intubated safely through anesthesia. Uh, there's just a towel uh, or a blanket to help bolster or literally support the head because without it, the head you know, would, would, ne would, ne would essentially uh, hang in free air. Uh, we use Gardner-Wells tongs using intraoperative neuromonitoring, uh, motor evoked, as well as SSEPs. And uh, here uh, we're placing the Gardner-Wells tongs. Prone position on the Jackson table, we're gonna, we use bivector uh, traction. So using two uh, uh, pulleys to provide intraoperative traction while we're doing this operation. Uh, to avoid uh, having to um, create sort of um, jerky and spontaneous movements as uh, can be associated with a Mayfield head holder. So I used to perform this using a Mayfield, but uh, abandoned this as I, I didn't like having to scrub out of the operation and having uh, my resident or chief resident direct, only be the set of hands in the operating room, have to climb under the table, adjust the Mayfield, and uh, perform the release and the correction uh, 
Uh, and as you know, the Mayfield has a number of different joints and uh, depending on how stuck they are or how loose they are, sometimes that can cause uh, an abrupt change. Uh, and because of that, uh, we resorted to using this the technique that uh, I know that Dan Rue had uh, really championed with the bivector traction and has been very helpful and, and successful, successful uh, in our practice. And this is what it looks like. So we have one a set of weights going uh, directly from the halo tongs uh, to a set of weights through the Jackson table. And then we have another one going over the H bar uh, that we can manipulate and add weight to as the case uh, proceeds. And this is sort of what that looks like. You can see where the head is relative to the bar of the Jackson table. You have the neuromonitoring leads that are there. Uh, as, as anyone who's done these operations and see here is not much space there. We'll have to uh, trim the hair, tape the shoulders back. Uh, but this triangulation of the intraoperative traction really gives us uh, flexibility and also allows for um, a slower release and assessment of the correction that's done as the osteotomies are performed. So when this patient is draped, uh, prepped, and the osteotomies are done and the instrumentation is performed, staying sterile, I can easily grasp the Gardner-Wells tongs sterily and elevate the head and really see in real time how much correction I'm getting. So that also helps me assess, do we need to do more than the posterior column osteotomies? You know, is the three column osteotomy gonna be required? How much of the osteotomy needs to be done? So being able to manipulate it in real time, elevating the head without scrubbing out of surgery can be very helpful. And this is just another way of looking at that. Uh, many people have asked and have visited, uh, you know, our, my cases and seeing exactly how we do that. And that's how the triangulation is done. And again, so this is a tip, this is a trick that I use. I take two non-penetrating towel clamps and I essentially clip them around the Gardner-Wells tong. So, uh, so that I don't have to, again, scrub out of surgery, get underneath the drape, uh, and uh, I think that's an unsettling feeling for a lot of surgeons. So by putting the towel clips there, they serve as sort of very visual reminders, almost like antennas, where at any given point of the case, I know exactly where the head is, whether um, there's a change in the head position because of the, the weights or uh, whatever, it, whatever it is, I have always have a visual cue and sense for where the head is in real time. This is an intraoperative view. Uh, uh, and so the uh, cervical lateral mass screws are to the left of your screen and the thoracic pedicle screws are to your right. And here the spinal cord, the fecal sac is in the midline. The top part of the screen is the right side of the patient. Here, the kerosin rangeur is just lateral to the C7 uh, pedicle. Here, we're basically uh, uh, disarticulating the lateral aspect of the facet mobilizing the vertebral artery. Uh, that Penfield instrument is right in the axilla of the C7 nerve root. And laminectomy has been performed. Facet osteotomy has been performed above and below. That's why we see the C7 and C8 nerve root. And now we're working primarily on that C7 pedicle on the right side. Here, so uh, the uh, Penfield now is retracting the C8 nerve root and the uh, C7 there's a suction tip essentially right on the C7 pedicle. I use intraoperative navigation to help guide the osteotomy planning for uh, the PSO at the cervical thoracic junction. Again, this uh, the case was C7, but now we're using the same technique at T1 and T2. And we published this in operative neurosurgery uh, a year ago, uh, utilizing navigation to really help guide us because uh, you know, that, that's a really small working channel and you have the vertebral artery laterally, you have the C7 and C8 nerve roots uh, just millimeters away and you have the fecal sac of the spinal cord uh, just medially. So the working channel is not great. There is always going to be epidural bleeding um, from the uh, uh, venous plexus in that area. So really seeing where you are as you're drilling into the pedicle can be very difficult. Uh, so I started using navigation to just to help guide exactly where that osteotomy is going to be and how deep we're going, because it can become a very deep and dark channel going into that body. And what we don't want to do is get into the disc space above or below uh, and, you know, 
and get actually through the ventral cortex of the vertebral body. So using navigation can be very helpful in that regard, using it as we guide. And now with navigated drills, we can actually drill, whether it's using a bone scalpel or even a um, typical a diamond or cutting burr that can be also that can be navigated as well, linking to navigation and giving us real time visualization of not only the depth, but also the trajectory of our osteotomy. And here again, osteotomy is being done, navigation is being used. You can see the depth markers on the navigation probe. Here we're now about 20, uh, uh, 20 millimeters deep into the pedicle, confirming on our navigation screen. Again, working in between the C7 and C8 nerve roots. And this is what that looks like. This is a screenshot from the navigational computer. Again, confirming, yes, we're down that pedicle. And the bottom left caption shows me that, hey, I'm, I'm pretty close, if not at that ventral most cortex of the virtual body. I don't want to drill past that, you know, because at this point, it's all tactile. Uh, otherwise, using the drill, it's a very narrow channel. I don't want to break through that. What's in front of that? The tracheoesophageal structures are there. I don't want to violate that. We've already protected the vertebral artery. We've protected the, outside, the, the surrounding nerve roots. So this really gives me real time, sort of another set of eyes to know exactly where I'm going. And especially when that patient's in kyphosis, you know, doing these operations, it's also very uncomfortable for the surgeon because we're looking at the patient at a very odd angle. And when you've been doing this for several hours, you know, our necks start to hurt. And so, uh, you know, you, we don't want to shortchange the osteotomy that's done just based on our comfort alone as well. So using the navigation can be very helpful to confirm and guide that osteotomy. And this is what it looks like in the end. We see two large holes on either side of the C7 PSO. C7 and C8 nerve roots are completely visualized. Navigation probe goes all the way to the depth Posterior wall of the C7 vertebral body has been resected as well as posterior longitudinal ligament, and we're ready to put our temporary rod fixation and perform the osteotomy. And this is a lateral view, again, from the x-rays showing that the rods are seated in the thoracic spine initially, and the rods are contoured to the degrees of cervical lordosis that I'd like. And again, grasping the Gardner-Wells tongs and bringing the head up towards the cervical screws, in addition to using uh, cervical reduction towers that are placed allows us to make sure that we aren't creating a scoliosis and we're actually not creating a, a change in the coronal alignment uh, and, uh, and gradually using the combination of the reduction towers as well as a manual reduction, bringing the screws and the spine up to the rod sequentially. In this case, this uh, operation was done between C2 and T4. And again, this is that buckling of the dura that you see of the spinal cord. And also you see that the both nerve roots are sharing a single foramen on both sides. So on the top part of your screen, you see the green screw, which is a lateral mass screw. And then you also see the uh, silver titanium screw of the thoracic pedicle screw. And all that bone has been resected in between so that it's a true pedicle to pedicle bony resection so that it's just the C7 and C8 nerve roots literally kissing within that foramen and making sure that there's no compression dorsally, ventrally, as well as laterally. Because the one reason why we've sort of abandoned the C7 and gone to T1 and T2 is that because uh, in, our, in our cases, and also I know that other cases reported in literature, these patients can develop significant uh, hand symptoms, whether it's uh, hand weakness, uh, paresthesias in the hands, uh, that can be delayed uh, several days to several weeks after surgery and, and can be permanent. They don't necessarily get better. And so that even though they're satisfied with the correction, they're satisfied with the maximal decompression of the spinal cord, these patients can be miserable because of the hand symptoms postoperatively. As you know, we need our hands to do a lot of things, whether it's to dress ourselves, brush our teeth, feed ourselves, self-care, uh, and that, that can be quite debilitating for these patients. And even with maximal decompression, maximal osteotomy, and making sure nothing is there, these patients can still develop that, whether on one side or, or, or both, or, or bilateral. So that is a consideration to think about when planning these operations. And, and you can search the literature, there have been reports of this, uh, so it's not a, an uncommon phenomenon. And these are the final radiographs. You can see preoperatively the degree of kyphosis. So it's not just the angulation, but it's also that SVA, right? So you can see that that angulation is better, but we've also brought that SVA back. 
So that person, their head is not shut forward so much. And then they're, they're now more aligned. And this is now several years out. Uh, you can see that that alignment all the way to the, uh, the right side. Uh, this is now more than five years out with, uh, there's always gonna be some degree of loss of that uh, SVA, but it's still significantly better than what you see all the way to the left uh, from the preoperative film. The question always comes up in terms of what is that ideal lowest instrumented vertebrae. Uh, this is one case where, uh, you know, this patient has not developed in five years distal junctional uh, kyphosis or failure. Um, there is, there has been some wedging of that most inferior vertebrae, uh, but really very little pain associated with that. I've had other patients that have developed further kyphosis. And now, uh, you know, if we're doing three column osteotomies at C7, T1, or T2, we are now, I am now extending that past the apex of the kyphosis somewhere to the T8, uh, T10 level. So that is a little bit of a moving target. And I think that uh, the literature still is a little bit undetermined with, with, that, with that regard, uh, still requires some further study. But I think with the degree of the SVA, and the type of osteotomy, particularly a three column osteotomy at the cervical thoracic junction, those are real considerations to extend that dors that thoracic instrumentation further down past the apex of the thoracic kyphosis. And this is just representative of the first five years uh, of doing these operations at the MGH and uh, developing uh, the uh, deformity program there, uh, first 20 patients or so. And you can see, we, we you know, I had one patient uh, that was paralyzed from this operation, someone in their 70s, uh, a really difficult case, a previous uh, front back operation uh, that was done more than 20 years ago with worsening uh, myelopathy and severe chin on chest deformity. Complications are real. These patients are older. They tend to be more frail. Assessing the frailty and the medical comorbidities of these patients is very important in addition to all the parameters and all of the sort of surgical diagnostics that we talked about in the last uh, 40 minutes or so. And as you can see, there were three cases that we had in our first five years uh, of patients who had three column osteotomies at C7 that developed hand weakness. Uh, and I will tell you very honestly, in those three patients, the hand weakness did not get better. So unlike situations, maybe like a C5 palsy where maybe after three or six months that may improve, uh, in these cases, I think with the uh, C7, the lower uh, nerve roots and the uh, um, involvement of the lower trunk of the brachial plexus, much less forgiving in terms of uh, regenerative uh, capability and rehabilitation. So that being said, my takeaway points, uh, I hope this was uh, useful and educational, is that planning is very important. And so much of the planning uh, goes, uh, really happens before that patient gets to the operating room, needing to assess the alignment, the plan, the goals of correction, assessing the flexibility deformity, and then really, you know, applying those osteotomy techniques. And, uh, you know, we could talk for another hour about complications, avoidance, medical frailty, preoperative um, optimization, rehabilitation, bone density, augmentation, you know, those are all things that also um, are, are bundled in with the care of these very complex case, uh, patients. So uh, with that, I'll conclude. Happy to take any questions. And again, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come to, uh, to join you all for this wonderful international meeting. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Shin. I'm sure a lot of people has lots of questions for you and have learned a lot uh, right now. Um, I want to ask you the first question right now, sir, is when do you take the decision to fix, say, the occiput too? That's a really great question. And I think a lot of that uh, depends on, uh, you know, first of all, what I'll say is we try to really preserve um, that occiput to C2 um, area, because as you can see, you know, patients, they, they still will get a certain degree of flexion extension from that. You know, it could be anywhere between even 20 to 30 degrees. Um, and even though you've locked them in across the cervical thoracic junction, um, you know, there's a certain morbidity to truly locking them in because that will, in essence, really affect their pharyngeal muscles as well. It can affect their voice. Uh, even things like sleep can be very difficult. I think times when I'm really inclined to go to the occiput is when they really have a significant deformity, SVA more than eight centimeters, um, chin on chest deformity, and really prohibitive 
anatomy at C2. So as I said, we get the CT imaging. And if I can put a pars interticularis or a good sized C2 pedicle screw uh, at that level, uh, then I will go to the occiput, you know, because I think that uh, the fixation, uh, that anchor point at C2 has become very important. And just like we're concerned about the distal junctional kyphosis, uh, those C2 screws can pull out if you're just putting a 16 or 18 millimeter screw through a very narrow channel. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jose is asking, um, where do you place the antenna for navigation, the reference? Is it useful when, you, when you, you're not the patient fixation? It, when the patient's not fixated? That's a great point. Always comes up uh, when I show this example and this technique. Uh, so if we're doing that osteotomy C7, T1, T2, I'm going to put that right on the spinous process uh, as close as I can to where we're doing the work. So if I'm doing a T1 PSO, I'm going to put that right at about T3 and angle it so that the a navigation computer can see it. And so oftentimes we'll have the uh, navigation um, camera uh, on the anesthesia side looking over the drape and the uh, actual reference arc on that thoracic uh, uh, spinous process angled up. Uh, so it's kind of out of our working field. And again, I put all the instrumentation in first, so it's not going to be in the way. So I won't necessarily use the navig. I don't use a navigation to put the screws in. Uh, we'll just put the screws in to begin. We'll expose, put all the hardware in, do the osteotomies, um, and then um, use the navigation to plan. So with that being said, um, it is very helpful in that regard. Uh, we do we use the O-arm to do that, and we'll use uh, calibration and verify those points. The one question uh, related to that that people often ask is, with the head in Gardner-Wells tongs and not rigidly fixated, um, is there motion and is it reliable to use navigation at context? And in my experience, it has actually been very uh, effective because uh, where we're working, especially like a T1, the vertebrae is still anchored by the ribs. And, um, uh, and uh, before, you know, if we're doing a lot of the work before disarticulating the T1 rib, uh, it's, it's pretty fixed. So we haven't had really issues with the navigation being off. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, Kyrie is asking, how about doing the correction surgery in a semi-sitting position? Semi-sitting position. Uh, that's a really interesting concept. I mean, I have, not, I have, have personally not done that. Uh, I know that uh, when I was a trainee in neurosurgery, I trained at UIC with uh, Fadi Charbel, who I know was on this program earlier. Uh, and we did sitting position, and I'm sure he still does sitting position operations for a variety of uh, um, cranial applications. And uh, I think they have a host of uh, sort of uh, anesthetic and also surgery related complications related to that and also quite challenging for the surgeon as well in that position. So I, I personally have not tried it uh, in that approach. I know that uh, some other colleagues, I know um, uh, Rick Fessler has uh, published and talked about doing sort of endoscopic foraminotomies and uh, other type of keyhole approaches in the sitting position. Uh, but I think in terms of deformity correction, uh, I, I, I'm not familiar with that approach. But if you try it, love to see you do it and let's see what happens. So. Have you seen any relationship between increased pelvic tilt and cervical thoracic junction kyphosis? And do you think it, it could be related uh, clinically? I think it could be related clinically. I, I, I think, you know, what we're doing now, um, I think is we're now paying more attention to these alignment parameters. And so I think that... Um, you know, I think if you're seeing a patient with a herniated disc at C4-5 or C5-6 and they've got a radiculopathy and you're going to do ACDF or foraminotomy, you know, there's probably not much utility in getting a full three-foot scoliosis x-ray. Um, and so I think that we don't really have a great sense of what the normal distribution is in terms of, you know, the pelvic parameters and the parameters of the cervical thoracic junction. And so that's why I brought up that slide looking at sort of you know, looking at the pelvic tilt, pelvic incidence is also, as well as the T1 slope and the cervical lordosis and trying to quantify that. Um, I don't think that's, I mean, I think there are a lot of great theories about that. I think we need to validate some of those theories with actual uh, patient data and, and outcomes, both radiographic and, uh, and also complication data. Okay, sir. We have lots of questions, but I'm gonna tell the public too that, um, Dr. Marcos is starting his conference okay. 
and the, in the other room. But I'm I'm gonna go and a couple more questions for you before sure. that. Uh, people can join his conference uh, through our website uh, the same way they did to 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 this, or by using the link on the chat. Um, there is a question here. When a patient presents for cervical laminectomy infusion for stenosis and their presenting neck posture is straight and not textbook lordosis, do you think it is best to induce lordosis in the fixation fusion construct or to fuse them in their usual position? And what published data supports either, support, either approach? Uh, I think that, uh, well, first of all, I would say that, you know, when we're doing any type of fusion operation, I think it's very valuable to um, get the upright cervical spine x-rays just to see what their alignment is. And also the flexion and extension. And not, not, not necessarily to look for instability. That may be what the radiologists are commenting on, but it's really to see, you know, what are, what is their physiologic range of motion that's there? Um, and I think that the goal of surgery should always be to try to uh, maximize the lordosis for, for what, you know, that patient is giving you in the operating room. So if the patient clinically does not have a deformity, is not kyphotic, and maybe that SVA is four or five centimeters, it's not bothersome to them, you know, I think that there is value to getting some lordosis, you know, if you're instrumenting between C3 and C6, C3 and C7. I think it's actually very easy to fuse someone in kyphosis and straight unintentionally. Whether you're using a regular OR table with gel rolls or you're using a Jackson table, a Mayfield or pillow, I think there are a lot of positioning considerations that really affect how we instrument those patients. So I think that whether you're trying to consciously or you know, uh, or, or I mean, intentionally or unintentionally fuse them in a certain way. I think it's more likely that, you know, we tend to fuse straight or in kyphosis, you know, because of how we position them for surgery. I think if you're using the Mayfield and the Jackson table, you know, that, that chest bolster really accentuates that apical thoracic kyphosis. And you really have to elevate the head to make sure that they're not kyphotic. Um, that being said, I think that simple things that you can do in the operating room. So what I do is, you know, when I, we have the lateral mass screws in or, you know, and we're, we've got the rod contoured is simply by, and if the head is fixated in the Mayfield, if you've done a laminectomy, you know, simply, uh, you know, taking that bent rod and pushing down a little bit, you'll notice shortens the uh, spine somewhat, induces a little bit of lordosis, and then putting the set caps in and torquing that down. Sometimes that's all you need. You don't necessarily have to compress against the screws like we do in the thoracic spine. Like if you're doing a T, I mean the lumbar spine, if you're doing a T lift and you're compressing against the cage, you don't necessarily have to do that in the cervical spine simply by putting a little pressure on the rod and using a rod holder, you know, within the, within the uh, construct will induce a little bit of lordosis. And you'll see that right away, you know, visually as well as on the x-ray. In terms of actual literature, I don't have that off the top of my head. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to, we can share my email. I, I do have uh, citations and, you know, references I'm happy to provide you know, from this talk and else and otherwise uh, related to this. Okay, sir. Then the last question, it's, there's lots of questions, but I can't, I can't go anymore. Uh, what recommendation do, do you offer for vertebral artery injury, intraoperative vertebral artery injury? Yeah, I think that um, it's, um, that's always a difficult situation. And honestly, I think if you're doing complex cases, um, you're going to have complications like that. I have had vertebral artery complications. And, um, you know, I think first and foremost is you have to get, you have to pack it off and get hemostasis. If it's related to putting a screw in, I would say, you know, if you, if it's, a, if it's like a C2 screw and you think you violated that and you've got a a burst of blood, I would say, put the screw in, close it up, get that patient to the endovascular suite and get an angiogram and see what's going on there before a pseudoaneurysm forms or a thrombus forms. I would not, you know, try to finish the operation, but I would, you have to try to temporize it somewhat. And if there is a pinpoint uh, area where it's, it's bleeding and it's coming out of a bony channel that can be plugged, I would do that. One of the hardest times sometimes is that if it's through an, if there's an area of soft tissue defect, 
like you've already done a lot of osteotomy mobilization of different muscles and nerve roots and it's just bleeding uncontrollably in those situations it's very difficult to actually find the proximal distal ends of that uh, in situations where I know I'm going to be working with the vertebral artery, I'll always have the aneurysm clips in the room ready to go on the Mayo table. I have our team do that with a 10 milli or like an eight or 10 millimeter straight aneurysm clip ready to go on the holder. I just have that versus, you know, asking people to scramble for that. That's always a bad situation. Uh, so, I, you know, it's part of it is anticipating that. But there have not been many situations in the situations that I've had where I was actually able to identify that because, you know what, when that vessel is bleeding, it bleeds really briskly, whether for a deformity operation or for, let's say, an oncologic operation, uh, like an on-block resection, it, it bleeds pretty briskly. And sometimes your best bet is really to pack it off, try to get hemostasis, don't let that patient become hemodynamically unstable and get that patient to the endovascular suite. I think in cases where you can clip obliterate it, uh, I, there are surgeons that can do that and much more technically facile than I, I think that's, that's really great. But when that does happen, I mean, when it does bleed, uh, that can be a harrowing experience. So my recommendation is keep the patient alive, get hemostasis, pack it off with whatever, and simply thrombotic agents like, um, you know, like flow seal or surgery flow or whatever you're using, it's not going to be enough because that just pulverizes and gets really uh, blown away. So what I would say is you have to use something else. Uh, to get the hemostasis in that situation. Okay, sir. Uh, I'm getting lots of questions. I'm, I'm going to go in with a couple more, I think. Um, in it's patients with, bad, so I'm going to think that that's a good it's, thing. It's, it's, it's very good, I think. <laughs> in patients with cervical kyphosis and lumbosacral imbalanced, loss of lordosis, do you resolve the cervical or the lumbar pathology first? How much time do you wait in between? You know, I think that's a, that's a really great question. And I, I ultimately, I think, you know, it goes back to, um, you have to treat the patient, right? So um, I did my fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic and a lot of great surgeons and mentors, uh, including Ed Benzel. And, and, and Dr. Benzel would always say, you have to you have to talk to the patient. I mean, it seems silly, right? We all do that, but you really, you really have to get down to what is, what is driving their disability and what's their problem. And I think the challenge oftentimes is, is those patients with uh, ink spawn. So those patients have horrible pain in their neck, their low back and flat back deformity and whatnot. And I think that unless that patient is severely myelopathic and deteriorating from an actual cervical cord issue, and, and they really have a severe mismatch in their lumbar lordosis pelvic incidence, we'll try to optimize their uh, um, biomechanics and their lower lumbar issue first and wait somewhere between you know, six months, uh, if not longer, uh, to tackle on the, the other issue, if that issue really is a problem. But I think you have to owe it to the patient to try to address one of the issues, give them enough time to rehabilitate, you know, adjust to the new sort of musculoskeletal balance that they have, uh, work with physical therapy, rehabilitate, and then come back to the table and have that discussion, you know? So, but I mean, we do have patients that have had, you know, L3, L4 PSOs, and then ended up having something else done for their cervical thoracic deformity. Okay. Um, if you have to find, you happen to drop in motor potentials during closure of the osteotomy, what's your behavior? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> so, uh, that, that's one reason why I honestly gave up on the Mayfield. So, um, because, you know, for me, it's like I'd have to scrub out and we have really fantastic residents at the MGH, but still I'd have to be under there and you know what, the, what it's like down there. You have anesthesia tubes, wires, things are dripping and uh, you can't see anything, you know, and we check motors all the time, you know, when we're going to do the osteotomy and when I was releasing the Mayfield, and I know other colleagues still use it. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just my own personal practice bias you know, releasing the Mayfield, it's, it limits you in certain ways and it's going to jerk because it's got like four or five different articulations. And um, what I don't like about it is that when you make a move, it can suddenly jerk and maybe kink the cord. Um, and uh, so that's one reason. So with the Gardner Wells tongs, that case of paralysis that I had was actually with the Mayfield head holder. And like most surgeons, we change our behavior after something bad happens. Uh, but, you know, I, with using the Gardner Wells tongs, and that approach where I can put my hand on the thoracic kyphosis and put my hand on the garden walls tongs 
and sort of like close it slowly, um, I can see that dura buckling and I'll actually have them do the motors as I'm doing it. So I'll tell them, I'll put my hand, you know, on the thoracic kyphosis, you know, the navigation thing is off. I grab the Gardner Wells tongs and I say, hey, give me, you know, shoot me a motor right now. And then as I'm doing it, you know, I'm seeing the dura buckle, I'm seeing that wedge close. We'll have them do it once or two times. You know, we'll get the, the rod locked in, same thing. And we'll just kind of wait and I'll irrigate like crazy. I tell anesthesia, keep that mean arterial pressure above 90 to keep it high. We keep it high the whole case. Um, uh, and that's what we kind of do when that happens. Now, if we do get a change, now there are times as we're, as I'm doing that, we will get changes. And one of the first subtle things that happens is that the, um, the SSCPs will start to decrease in amplitude and increase in latency. And they'll tell me that they'll say, Hey, you know, you know, as you know, the SSCPs, they average over time. So it's not immediate, but they'll say, Hey, you know what? We're seeing a real fluctuation. There's a real change. And, you know, we'll, well, first, you know, we love to blame anesthesia, right? So we blame anesthesia. Hey, what are you doing? You know, and you give a bullet to propofol, you know, so we can't blame anesthesia, can't blame the resident, the medical student, can't blame the nurse. So we got to, you know, so we're, we're done blaming other people. So we're just trying to figure it out. So, yeah, I'm just, just joking, obviously. But, yeah, so we, we have, we try to keep the maps up. But, yeah, when that does happen, I will slow down that correction and I'll just go back to neutral. So hands off, you know, I'll irrigate check the maps, you know, drive the maps even higher. And we'll just wait for several minutes, just kind of let it cool off. Most of the time it will improve. Have there been times where we've seen a decrement in the motors, 50%, 70%? Yes. And we stop, you know, same idea, irrigate, wait, drive the maps up, can get some steroids. I do it. You know, is there data for it? You know, I mean, don't shoot me, but there probably isn't, but we give 10 milligrams of Decadron, you know, the, you're obviously in hyperdrive, right? It's like the worst possible complication, one of the worst possible complications you can have. So uh, we're doing all those things. And, and most of the time, it will actually get better, you know? And so when we relax, and I'll just wait. Sometimes I'll wait 20 minutes, 30 minutes, we'll irrigate, and we'll tell, you know, make sure everyone's ready. Anesthesia, monitoring, nursing, everyone, we'll just make sure everyone's ready, and then we'll do it again. But that's the sense what we do. So it's checking the maps, checking the anesthetic, I actually had one case, I don't want to, you know, uh, embarrass my colleagues, but I actually had one case where the motors did drop out and it was because, you know, the connection uh, got dislodged. And the reason why is because I was maneuvering the head so much back and forth, kind of rehearsing, you know, like rehearsing in my, you know, just before doing the full, full closure, I was doing the rehearsing. And, you know, as you know, a lot of times these wires and leads, they're kind of like wrapped up, they're bundled, they're taped to something on the Mayfield. And I think when I did that, it literally pulled the plug out of the socket. And so they just kind of had a flat line. And so uh, that that was obviously, you don't want to live through that. So I'm just telling you from my experience, you know, that that also can be a possibility. So if that is what happens, good for you, because that that's actually uh, something that can be reversed pretty quickly. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, sir. Thank you. I think nobody likes flat lines or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, sir, it's been great to having you here. As a speaker, uh, on behalf of Sienna, I'd like to thank you. A uh, wonderful lecture you've given us. Uh, lots of questions have, are, are open for, for answer, but, but I can't go anymore. Uh, more than 300 people were connected to your conference. Over 3,200 people have been registered to our webpage. And your conference will be open, uh, will be on, on YouTube uh, next week. So uh, I want to invite you to stay tuned to any other conference that uh, you're interested in. And uh, we hope to continue in touch for, for future educational purposes. And uh, I want to uh, say have a great day and thank you for everything. When, okay. uh, Thanks again. And that, like I said, you know, if anyone has any questions, please feel out. Uh, you, you feel free to reach out to me through uh, email or social media, Twitter, LinkedIn. You know, happy to do that. You know, so um, anytime, very happy to share. Uh, you know, any uh, cases or any further questions. So, and again, thank you so much for having me. Really, it was fantastic. Had a, had a great time. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Take care. Take care. Bye. Goodbye.